morning. Everybody doing okay? You guys good? Good? I was told to ask people to scoot in if they see people around them that don't have seats, but it looks like everyone has a seat for the most part. So a couple up here on the front row, if someone wants to come down here, you can be close to me. It's fun. <laughs> and no one cheered at that. That's kind of hurtful. Uh, Thank you guys for being here this morning. If you're, if you're a guest here, um, welcome. If you're a regular, we, we welcome you as, as well. You come here every week. Thank you for that. So uh, it's Resurrection Weekend, and um, it's a little bit different than, than other weekends because we specifically focus on the fact that Jesus is resurrected from the grave. If you're new here, here's what we typically do. We go through whole books of the Bible, and we have been in a book of the Bible called the Gospel of John. It's the fourth book of the New Testament, and we work through it word for word, line by line, verse by verse, until we get all the way through. That's what we always do here, except for baptism lessons, vision service lessons. But besides that, we're always just working line by line through different books of the Bible. What I am excited about is, uh, if you're new here, you kind of get to see what we normally do. It will be slightly different, but, but really not much. We're going to stay in the Gospel of John today. But we're going to fast forward. We just wrapped up with chapter 7 last week. Savut did an absolutely phenomenal job teaching chapter 7, if you were here. Everyone likes Savut. And today we're going to do chapter 20. So we're going to skip a little bit, and then we'll go back next week, and we'll be back at chapter 8, uh, where, we, where we properly should be systematically going through the Gospel of John. So if you decide to come back next week, we'll still be in the same book. We're just going to go back a little bit, pick up where we left off. If you weren't here last week, um, again, Savut taught on chapter seven, did a great job. I think the most provocative thing that he said, I thought I was sitting at the back at the seven o'clock on Saturday and listened to uh, uh, the whole message that he taught. And something that I, I, I love that Savut said is he said, if we don't drink the living water of Jesus, we will drink some kind of water. We will drink something that fills us. And what he meant by that and what the Bible means by that is, is we are to consume Christ, right? Jesus, God. We're to consume him and he fills us up. He fulfills us, empowers us, enables us to live the way that we're supposed to live. If we do not fill that God-shaped hole, if you will, with God, we try to fill it with other things. And it's usually destructive. It's not good for us, okay? That's what Savut said last week. Very, very good lesson. Go back and watch that if you weren't here. Here's what we're going to talk about this week. Of course, we're going to talk about the resurrection. That's what chapter 20 of John is about, but we're going to maybe take a different approach to it, a little bit different of a slant, and we're going to go through all of chapter 20. We're going to talk about Jesus' resurrection, but, but let, here, here's the thing about Jesus' resurrection. He didn't need to be resurrected for himself. Jesus' resurrection was actually all about our resurrection, and that not only are we all going to be, every human that's ever existed, we're all going to be resurrected from the dead at the end of time. And we will either be resurrected to an eternity with God or we will be resurrected to an eternity apart from God. That will happen with everyone. For those of us who give our lives to Jesus in this life, we will be resurrected spiritually. And that enables us to live a life where we understand our value. We understand our purpose and our mission. Uh, we have confidence, not in ourself, but in our, our, our creator that we're made in the image of. And so we experience two resurrections, if you will, okay? That's what we're going to talk about today. So glad you're here. You should have got a notes hand out when you walked in. Everything we're gonna, we're gonna talk about will be in that. Everything will be on the screens. Um, if you have a smartphone, which is about everyone over the age of seven right now, if you download the Experience Community app, click on Sermon Notes, you got the scripture and the notes right there. If you're old school like me and you still like books, if you have a Bible, we are in the fourth book of the New Testament. We're going to be in the 20th chapter of John, okay? And that's where we're going to be reading from today. Good stuff, fun stuff. Glad you're here. It's supposed to be a beautiful day out there. Is it, is it nice? Okay, I haven't been out there since 6.30 this morning, so I hope it's good. I, I very, uh, maybe it was presumptuous, but I, I, I wore the flip-flops today because I heard it was going to be really nice. Oh, yeah, you guys like that, huh? Yeah, look at that. Corey's feet. All right, let me pray. <laughs> <laughs> and we will dive into this chapter, and uh, you guys can enjoy the rest of your Easter Sunday, okay? Let me pray. Father God, we love you. Lord, we thank you so much. Thank you for everyone in this room today, God. I, I, I thank you, Lord, for the freedom and the liberty that we have to get to do what we're doing, to, to worship you freely, to study the Word of God, and, and hopefully get to know you better. Lord, I pray that you just, just keep your hand on this church this morning. 
We pray not only for our church, Father, we pray for every church in our city, pray for our other campuses and the the churches in those areas, God. We pray for all the wonderful nonprofits that we get to work with, and we pray that they can help be the, the hands and feet of you on earth and in our communities. And Father, ultimately, as we talk about the resurrection today, God, I pray, Lord, that uh, we glorify you, that we honor you in this time, Lord, and that we are drawn closer to you. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. Pray all these things in your son's name, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, chapter 20. Let me read a little bit. We'll go back and we'll break it down. We'll break it into a couple of different parts, okay? Here we go. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Let me pause there for a second. If I wrote a book of the Bible, I would also refer to myself as the one Jesus loved. (laughs) And said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on Jesus' head was not laying with the other linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first, then also went in, saw, and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Okay, so if you're new here, let me, let me just kind of throw this out from the get-go. Um, we kind of take, a, a, I say, a healthy pride in this church of addressing some of the tough topics. One of the tougher topics, hopefully this will clarify that it's not that tough of a topic, One of the tough things that Christians run into is sometimes people who are antagonistic towards Christianity or the Bible will say, well, how do you reconcile these discrepancies that are in your Bible? What I mean by that is, if you read the story of the resurrection in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are slight differences in all four of them. Now, does that discredit the Bible? Does it mean these guys were lying? They didn't know what they were talking about? Absolutely not. With a little bit of research and a little bit of study, we find out that they really aren't discrepancies at all. The four gospels were written by four different people for four different groups of people. Well, actually two different groups of people. Two of them, Matthew and Mark, were writing predominantly for Jews. John, that we're studying today, and Luke were writing predominantly for non-Jews. So they picked out different things from the life of Christ, different experiences that would appeal to the audiences they were writing Two, they're all factual, they're all true. So again, a little bit of study, a little bit of research, and we find out that the Bible does not contradict itself. We are gonna be focusing mostly on the Gospel of John. I may sprinkle in a little bit of Luke, a little bit of Matthew in there, but for the most part, we're gonna focus on John chapter 20, okay? So this chapter starts three days after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We are not positive what day of the week Jesus was crucified. Don't throw anything at me. It probably wasn't a Friday. It's okay to celebrate Good Friday. We celebrate Good Friday. If you count the fact that he was in the grave for three days, Friday doesn't work. It was probably a Thursday. Again, it doesn't matter. Don't leave this church over that. It's not the end of the world, okay? What we do know is Jesus was buried in the tomb of a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea for for three days. On the third day, Sunday, Mary Magdalene and a couple of other women, also named Mary, came to to finish up burial rites for Jesus' body. So when they get there early in the morning, to, to their shock and amazement, the tomb of the stone had been moved and there was no body in the tomb. So Mary takes off running back to the disciples, to the other disciples. And, and, and kind of ironically, The one she goes to first is Peter. Now, if you know much about the disciples, you would say, well, of course you went to Peter. He was kind of the the, the unnamed, kind of unofficial leader of the disciples. But Peter was not present for the crucifixion. Not only was, was Peter absent when Jesus was crucified, he denied Jesus three times. So it's an odd choice that she would run to him. 
And so Peter and John are together. Mary tells these two disciples what happened. They take off running. You have to love John. Not only does he call himself the beloved disciple, he mentions that he's a faster runner than Peter. (laughs) Just good times, right? So he says they left. He outran Peter, got there first. But when John got there, John did not run into the tomb. And we would ask why. Why did John not go in the tomb? Now, this is interesting. Now, John was the only disciple who was present for the crucifixion. Imagine being the only one of the 12 to see how viciously and and terribly Jesus's body had been mangled. Maybe he didn't want to run into the tomb because he was a little nervous of what he would see. Maybe it would trigger these thoughts of seeing his Lord and his Savior be beaten and crucified, and maybe he didn't want to see that. So he didn't go in immediately. And then we have our buddy Peter. Peter was quite impulsive. Not only was Peter impulsive, he probably was riddled with a lot of guilt for denying Jesus and shame. And he runs right in. And what Peter finds out is it wasn't chaos. It wasn't disorderly. All the clothes were folded up nice and neat at the edge of this this slab that Jesus was laid on, which shows us that this was premeditated. Someone had put some thought into the fact that this body was missing and the clothes were nicely folded up in the corner. Now, here's what's interesting. Not only Peter and John, Mary, all of them, they shouldn't have been that surprised by this. In the Gospel of Luke, it says they came back amazed, shocked, And they shouldn't have been as shocked as they were because not only did the scripture, the Old Testament at the time, foretell the fact that the the Messiah was going to die and be resurrected in multiple books of the Old Testament, Jesus himself also said directly to them, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be in the ground three days, and I'm going to rise. So they should have known this. But the Bible says they couldn't connect the resurrection And the scripture, they couldn't even connect what Jesus said in the resurrection. Why? The reason why is the disciples did not yet have the Holy Spirit of God. And what does that tell us? It tells us that it is impossible to understand the teachings of this book or even to have a relationship with God without the help of the Spirit of God. And what this shows us is this. If you're in this room this morning, and you're on a journey, right? You're asking the big questions. You're you're investigating who is God? Is there a God? What is my place in the universe? It's great that you're on that quest, but here's the thing with that. If it is strictly intellectual, we cannot find God strictly by intellectual means. It has to be a spiritual journey as well. This is why Jesus himself says we worship God in truth, That means our mind, our intellect, but we must also pursue him with the spirit, the heart. It has to be a spiritual journey as well, okay? Let's keep moving on. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus's body had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for or seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you've carried him away, Tell me where you've put him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. Okay, we're going to have fun with this one. So not only was Peter an interesting choice to be the first one to hear from Mary that Jesus had resurrected, Mary was an extremely interesting first choice to be the first witness of Jesus's resurrection. Why? 
There is, a, there is a very false narrative that Christianity, God, Jesus, people who follow God and Jesus, that we are misogynistic, that we are sexist. And that is nowhere biblically supported. Now listen, in this time, there was a lot of misogyny. Women were second-class citizens. They were still, in most of the Middle East today, women are second-class citizens, if they can even be citizens at all. That is not the case with Jesus. It is no accident that the first person Jesus reveals himself to is a woman. Not just a woman, a woman with an awful past. A woman who who would have been considered the lowest of the low. Not only was she promiscuous once upon a time, the Bible says she was demonically possessed once upon a time. And this is the first person who sees the resurrected Jesus. What do we learn from that? The first thing we learn is it doesn't matter gender, it doesn't matter color, it doesn't matter background or any of that. Anyone is welcome to have a relationship with Jesus if they want it. Amen. Some, I would thought I got some amen from some women at least on that or something, right? I got your back, ladies. So, <laughs> so we learn that, that, that there is equality with God. Everyone is on an equal playing field as long as they want to have a relationship with him. Not only that, we learn that our past can even be forgiven and that God is gracious. There are no mistakes in the Bible. There are no accidents in the Bible. This was very, very intentional. So Mary goes into the tomb. Okay, let's back up a little bit. She goes into the tomb and she sees two angels. I don't believe she realized that they were angels. The reason why I don't believe she realized they were angels, in most instances in the Bible, when people saw angels, they kind of freaked out a little bit. In fact, John in the book of Revelation says, (laughs) when he saw an angel, he fell down like a dead man. It means he passed out, right? It was too much. And so she walked in, she saw two guys wearing all white, and we know that they are angels, and they have this brief conversation. Now, most of the time throughout the Bible, when we see angels take part in things, it's usually either to proclaim to people what God is doing, kind of what's happening here, or it is executing God's plan. So in a, in a moment of possible embarrassment, Maybe Mary was just overwhelmed by the situation. She leaves, steps away from these two angels, turns around, and she bumps into a third individual. And she just presumes that this is the gardener, right? Early in the morning, this is the guy who's just taking care of the grounds. And if you read this, and if you know anything about Mary, you're like, how could she not recognize Jesus? She she walked around and traveled with this guy for three and a half years. This was her Lord, her savior, who she loved and adored more than anyone? How could she not recognize him? And it's actually pretty logical, though, why she couldn't recognize him. Imagine if you were in this situation. She was probably borderline hysterical. She's crying. She's not looking up. She's probably looking down, wiping her eyes. She is overwhelmed by her circumstances. Not only that, she, like Peter and John, may have forgotten the things that Jesus told her, that he would come back from the grave. Because of her situation, she let her situation overwhelm her and she couldn't see clearly and she couldn't think clearly. What do we learn from this? In a practical thing we learn, listen, we're all gonna go through times of loss. We're gonna go through times of stress. We're gonna go through tumultuous times where it seems like the world is just too much to handle. But In those times, we cannot take our eyes off of Jesus. When we let the problems of this world overwhelm us, not only can we not see Jesus properly, we may, listen, we may misidentify Jesus. We may not recognize him as who he is. That's what happened with her. The other thing is, is we have to be careful not to forget the promises of Jesus. And even in times when we don't always feel it here, We have to know it up here. We have to remember the things God has told us and we have to lean on those promises. So even after they have a conversation, and I absolutely love this part, even after they have a conversation, woman, why are you crying? What are you looking for? She still doesn't recognize who it is. It is only when Jesus says, Mary, only when he says her name, does it click? Does she, oh my gosh, teacher. It's you, Jesus. Now, you can probably research this and find something, you know, deeper and and more impressive than what I'm going to tell you, but I'm just going to tell you what I thought of when I read this and when I studied this. 
It's not that you and I, if you're a Christian in here, it's not just that we serve the God of the universe. It's not just that we serve the savior of humanity. There's 8 billion of us right now on planet earth, right? It's not just that we serve the the, the savior of humanity. It's that God is not some distant cosmic God. God is personal. God is not just the savior of humanity. God is the savior of Corey. He is the savior of you as an individual. And this should bring us tremendous comfort. And quite frankly, I believe in all of us at one point in our life, he calls our name. The question is, will we recognize him? Will we respond? Will that snap us out of our sin and our shame and our confusion? And so you can imagine what Mary does, exactly what I think I would have done. She probably leapt at him, grabbed him, didn't want to let him go. She thought she had lost him, and so she wanted to hold on to him. And what does Jesus say? He says, you you can't do this. You, You can't cling to me. And the reason why he said this was the followers of Jesus at this time had gotten used to following Jesus in physical form. They could see him, they could touch him, they could hear his voice. And Jesus is saying, that's about to change. See, Jesus was about to leave in physical form. At the end of the gospel of Matthew, at all the gospels, he ascends into heaven. You know, it's fascinating in the, in the first book of, uh, uh, after the gospels in the book of Acts, it says in Acts chapter one that he will return exactly how he left in physical form. But in the meantime, which is what we're living in right now, we do not have Jesus in physical form. We have Jesus in spirit form, which means I've never visibly seen Jesus. I've not audibly heard him speak. I believe in him. I trust him. I put all my trust in him. But we have to learn to live in supernatural faith, not physical sight. We don't live in physical sight right now. We live in supernatural, spiritual faith. Now, again, in the spirit of transparency, and if you're new here, this may be a little awkward in a church, but this is just, we like honesty at this church. In the spirit of honesty, in the spirit of transparency, any honest Christian in this room will tell you it's not always easy to walk by spiritual sight. Amen, somebody. Sometimes it's tough. Man, when you see the world around you, sometimes it's difficult to step back and go, I am confident God's in control. Because sometimes, I mean, it's nuts out there. It's crazy. In times of loss, in times of confusion, sometimes it's hard to walk by faith. So what do we do? If it's tough, how how do we build that muscle of faith in our soul? And if you come to this church regularly, you hear me say this virtually every single weekend. Here's how we build faith. First, we must pray. We must talk to God. Man, I say every day, you need to talk to God several times a day. You need to talk to him when you wake up. You need to talk to him before you go to bed. You need to talk to him on the way to work. You need to randomly just check in. We need to have a a, a communication relationship with Jesus. We have to pray. If our faith is gonna be built, we also have to surround ourselves with good godly people. That doesn't mean that you can't have friends that aren't Christians. I hope you do have friends that aren't Christians so you can minister to them and and love them properly, but we need to surround ourselves. We need to be very cautious. Listen, who speaks into our lives? If you're a lady in here and you get in an argument with your husband and you tell all your girlfriends and they're like, Sister, we're going to go to Nashville. We're going to hop on one of those little things where you pedal it and we're going to get wasted. We're going to go by the wild horse. There's a bunch of classy guys out there, right? I don't know if anyone goes. I don't even know if that even exists anymore. Fun story, because, you know, I've done this this year now, my fifth service of the weekend, so I'm comfortable and relaxed. I went down. I took my girls over spring break. My girls were both born in Nashville, but they've never really, like, done the Nashville thing. And so I took my my 14-year-old and my 10-year-old. We went to Second Avenue. We went to Broadway, all that kind of stuff. And it was 11 o'clock on a Wednesday. (laughs) Every bar is packed and the little little pedal cars. I mean, you had sorority girls getting drunk at 11 o'clock on a Wednesday. And I'm like, my God, this is Nashville now. It's insane. Here's the point. The point is this. If we don't have good people in our lives, we need to find ones that instead of when we get in an argument with our husband and our girlfriends are like, girl, let's go get wasted. No, no, no. You need to have women around you who are saying, we need to call the pastor. We need to get you counseling. We need to pray about this. We need to reconcile this because God wants your marriage to work. 
you need people. Listen, the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. So if we're constantly surrounded with dull wood, listen, this is why the Bible says this, bad company corrupts good morals. Do you know that's in the Bible? That who speaks into our life matters. Here's the other thing that we can do. We need to read the Bible, that's good. And then we also, to build our faith, we need to judge the fruit of a society that is not living by faith, but is living by their senses, by their physical sight. I'm not telling you to go out and judge people. The Bible says, Jesus said, we can judge a tree by its fruit. If the fruit is good, the tree is good. If the fruit is bad, the tree is bad. So we as Christians should be able to go out into the world and whenever people say, "Uh, man, it's really crazy to believe in a God that you can't see, in light of how our world is going right now, I'd say that's the most sane thing you can do right now. The world is nuts out there. So all we have to do is look at the fruit of the way the world is doing it. We're more depressed than we've ever been. We're more suicidal than we've ever been. We get divorced more often than we ever have. If we even give marriage a shot at all, we are more anxious. We are more aggressive. There is more violence. There is so much going on. So the fruit of the ways of the world don't make any sense to me. And that builds my faith in God. The crazier the world gets, the more confident I am in my relationship with God, okay? I'm gonna build that faith up. When it was evening on the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them the hands Uh, his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Okay, so this was Sunday evening. So Mary had heard Sunday morning and seen that Jesus was resurrected. She goes back and tells the disciples they probably haven't completely bought into this yet. And they are locked in a room out of fear of the Jewish government because of what had happened to Jesus. Basically, the disciples were afraid that if Jesus was unlawfully arrested uh, arrested and killed, the same thing could happen to them. So they were locked up in a home, hiding out. As they were locked up in this home hiding out, thinking that no one could get in, Jesus shows up. I always found this kind of humorous, right? These guys were probably really, really on edge. And Jesus just kind of pops up in a locked room and he goes, Shalom, (laughs) right? It was probably anything but Shalom in that exact moment. So here's the thing. To the disciples, they thought locked doors were protection, To the reader of this story, we understand that there is no wall or locked door that can keep Jesus from finding us. And that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. There is nowhere we can go where the resurrected Jesus cannot find us and speak to us and speak peace into us. And so after showing the disciples his scars, right? Look at my hands, touch my side. He prepares the 10 remaining disciples Remember, Judas has committed suicide. If you didn't know that, the one that betrayed Jesus, he took his own life. Thomas was still a disciple, but he was absent during this part. And he prepares them to be sent out to teach. And so John records that Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit of God. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you, again, you don't have to do this, but if you skip ahead uh, a, a to the book of Acts, which is the next book of the Bible, The Holy Spirit was officially poured out about 50 days after this right here. But these guys had to have the Holy Spirit first because when they went out and it was poured out on everyone, someone had to be able to explain what was going on. And that was Acts chapter two. Peter does that. He gives probably one of the most important sermons ever given. And these guys get up there and they have understanding and they have knowledge because they were given the Spirit a little bit before everyone else was. And then verse 23 has caused a lot of controversy. There are certain groups of people who believe that that certain individuals are given the the power by God to absolve or forgive sin. 
Now, just for clarity, no human can forgive you of your sin. I don't care what their title is, what their position is. No one can forgive you of your sin except for Jesus Christ himself. We have to repent to him. So what does verse 23 mean? What Jesus is essentially doing, he's about to send his disciples out into the world. He's giving them the Holy Spirit. They know everything that he has taught them. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go out, make disciples, teach them, and baptize them. When they go out into the world to, to, to make more followers of Jesus, they have been given the, the power, they have been given the knowledge to proclaim what is right and what is wrong. So they are given the power by God. It is not wrong of us as Christians. If someone goes, hey, do you think this is a sin? It doesn't matter what I think. Jesus said it's a sin. It's a sin. And we have to repent for that to Jesus. That is not us being judgmental. That is not us being wrong. In fact, that is exactly what Jesus empowered his disciples to do. And I find it very, very interesting, especially in, a, in, in Christianity in the United States right now. Churches don't even want to talk about repentance. We don't even want to talk about sin. We don't want to define what is right and wrong. I have gotten uh, colorful emails that say, why do you talk about sin so much? I talk about it because it's the one thing that will put a gap between you and your Savior. And we need to deal with that. Why? Because Jesus told us to. He commissioned us to go out and lay down the groundwork for what is righteous and what is unrighteous. Okay. Okay. But Thomas, also called twin, one of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. A week later, so it's the next Sunday, his disciples were indoors again and Thomas was with him. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. John writes, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing, this is very important, you may have life in his name. So some people say Christians are gullible, and there are some gullible Christians. Thomas was not one of them. <laughs> Thomas comes in, after, after missing the risen Christ, I don't know if maybe Thomas, out of frustration, went and got a cup of coffee, comes back, I miss anything, <laughs> miss something pretty big. So after hearing what had happened, the, the, the other disciples go, Jesus was here, we saw him, he is resurrected. And Thomas goes, well, until I see the scars in his hands, until I touch the side that the Roman soldiers pierced, I'm not gonna believe now, here's what we do as Christians 2,000 years removed. We are very good at judging people in the Bible. Well, I wouldn't have done it that way, right? I'm nothing like that, doubting Thomas. We call him names like this. Now, listen, Thomas was not a bad guy. Thomas was not a bad disciple. Thomas was worn out. He was weary. He felt defeated. He felt broken down. This is a man who traveled with Jesus for three and a half years, this is a man who gave up everything and then he saw his Lord and Savior be viciously killed. He was worn out. And in a moment of weakness, he had doubt. And he said, he did, if you haven't been here for John, we say the thesis of John is not seen as believing. It's actually, we have to believe to see God. And in this moment of weakness, Thomas said, I need proof. I have to see to believe. You know what else is interesting about Thomas, though? Thomas didn't give up on Jesus. It said the next Sunday, Thomas was back. They were probably worshiping. It was the next, they, they, they were probably doing the Lord's Supper. They were taking that, as Jesus said, in remembrance of him. They were, they were worshiping together. Maybe they were singing songs. Maybe they were reading some of the Old Testament scripture. They were locked in a room, and again, Jesus shows up in this locked room. He stood among them, and what does he do? He walks over to Thomas, and he goes, 
I think he wanted to see these. Touch this, Thomas. And then he looked at Thomas and he said, don't be faithless, believe. Now listen, he is not, he is not browbeating Thomas. He's not shaming Thomas. He's not making fun of Thomas because Thomas had a momentary lapse, right? Because he doubted a little bit. Listen, if we're gonna be honest in here again this morning, all of us as Christians have these moments. My old pastor used to say that every single one of us will look in the mirror, right? And we will have moments where we think we're crazy. That's going to happen. And if you're, if you're looking at me right now and saying, how dare a pastor say such a thing? Well, if you go back and read about John the Baptist, John the Baptist had a moment of doubt, didn't he? He's about to get his head cut off, gets a couple of his disciples, and he goes, hey, can you guys just go double check that Jesus is the right guy? I'm about to lose my head. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he did. They go back and they ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, John's about to get his head cut off. You're the right guy, right? And the people who heard that started making fun of John. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, wait a second. There has been no greater man that has ever existed than John the Baptist. And this is a man that had a moment of doubt. What that means to us, God does not browbeat us when we have questions. He doesn't browbeat us when we look up and we're like, God, I don't understand. I'm struggling right now. In fact, Jesus honored Thomas's coming back. He kept digging. He didn't dip out on Jesus altogether. He showed up the next week. He wanted to keep pushing forward. He was keep searching. And Jesus honored that search, that sincere looking. And listen, you and I are not given the same unique evidence that, that Thomas was. If you're waiting for Jesus to come back and, and prove it to you as an individual, look at my scars, look, look, touch my side, that's not the way it works for us. But that's not to say that we don't have evidence of God. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter one, there is so much evidence of God all the way around us, we're without excuse not to believe in God. I said it last night, it didn't work. It'll work tonight though, I think. If you go out tonight and there's a clear sky to look up and see the stars, if you have a, a good enough telescope that you can look at Saturn and see the rings, you can see Jupiter on clear enough nights when the planets are in the right position, even with the naked eye, you can look up and find Mars. If you look hard enough, it'll, it'll literally be red. You can see, a, you think it's a red star. It's not, it's Mars. And when you get into that kind of stuff, it is amazing to see the order of the universe and, and the intricacies of the universe. And, and Paul would say, this is proof. This is evidence. The problem isn't that there isn't enough evidence out there. The problem is a lot of people do not have a desire to see God. They don't have a desire to look. But Jesus said this. I don't care if you're an, an, an agnostic in here. I hope we still draw in tons of people questioning. I don't care if you're a, an atheist in here. My wife used to be an atheist until she was 22 years old. I, that, that, that doesn't bother me. If you're searching, if you're digging, if you're looking, if you're asking the right questions, Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, for those who genuinely seek, you'll find. You will eventually come to the truth. The question then remains when we come to that truth, Will we believe it? Will the truth be more important to us than our own preconceived notions or feelings? Will we believe the truth? And if we believe the truth, we are given life. I love what John says at the end of this chapter. He says, Jesus did a lot more than what I've written down. One of the authors said, if you were to fill up all the books of the things that Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough room for it on earth. Jesus did a lot more stuff, but John didn't record all of that. John recorded the certain things that he thought for people like us, non-Jews, there might be some Jewish people by blood near, but most of us are non-Jewish. John recorded certain things to where he said, I've recorded these things so you can read them and you can believe that Jesus is the Savior. And in that belief, we have life. We throw the word living around way too much. Man, you ever been to this certain place? That's living. Man, have you had like, you know, like Burger King's new like chicken fries? That's living. It's not. <laughs> we just throw around living like, like this very haphazard thing. Man, you know, those people who are super rich, that's living. Those people who get a lot of affirmation, man, that's living. Those beautiful people, that's living. That's not living either. You know what living is? Living is understanding that your value doesn't come from man, but from the creator of man. 
That's living. You know what living is? Understanding that you have a purpose, that you're not a mistake, that you're not here for, for no reason. That's living. And when we believe on the resurrected Christ, we are resurrected to life now, to understand what it truly means to live. This means that we have purpose now. We have value now. And then when we are all resurrected, we are resurrected to everlasting life with him for eternity in paradise. So there's a couple of things that gets in the way of our beliefs sometimes, gets in the way of us having a relationship with God. We talked about four different people today that were in this chapter, okay? And all of us will fall into at least one of these categories, maybe more than one. The first one is good old impulsive Peter, right? There's a lot of us in this room that sometimes we, we, we act and then we think, and that gets us into a lot of trouble. This is why the Bible says, be slow to speak, be slow to act, to just chill out for a second. Talk to God first. Don't let your emotions get the best of you because it causes a lot of problems. If you're new here, I often share awful things about myself. I'm going to do that now if that's okay. So on, on Wednesday, I uh, had both my girls with me. Wednesday was a, was a terrible day. Um, it was just a really, really rough day. Just been, just been in kind of a funk for the last couple of weeks. I had a, a pretty aggressive, not super friendly person get a hold of me and, and say some pretty um, aggressive, not friendly things to me. Had to go pick up my daughters from different things, traffic, raining. I mean, just everything bubbling up. And I finally got off this, this kind of uncomfortable phone call in my car and, and kind of in frustration, didn't even chuck it hard, guys. I tossed my phone up onto my dash in my car. Tossed it. I was just done with the phone. Tossed it. And in this impulsive toss, the corner of my iPhone, it's perfectly in the center of my windshield. Yeah, you guessed it. Spider web crack just all the way across. You know, when you do something stupid like that, you sober up real quick, don't you? <laughs> I am an idiot. <laughs> but we can be impulsive like that, and it gets us into problems. Maybe you don't struggle with impulsivity. Maybe uh, we deny Christ in times of stress. And instantly people go, I've never denied Christ in times of stress. Really? In times of hard, in, in hard times, you, you've never ran to the bottle instead of prayer? You've never ran to weed instead of prayer. You never ran to porn instead of prayer. Sorry, we're talking real here this Easter. But how many of us, even professing Christians, instead of running to our Savior, we've run for something else to bail us out? It's in essence denying him. We've done it. We've done it. How many of us are Marys that we feel marginalized? How many of us have Awful pasts, right? Pasts that we hope most people never hear about. How many of us have even gone so far to we are controlled by evil things? Again, I know talking about things like angels and demons in church is rare and people get freaked out by that, but they're both real. And there are people who are demonically either oppressed or possessed. Some of us have been delivered from things like this. Maybe we more identify with the struggles of Mary. Maybe we're like a Thomas. Maybe we have become skeptical Maybe we've become pessimistic, not because we're the worst people that have ever lived, but because, man, the world beats us down sometimes. So we become negative and weary. You know where I think a lot of us fall, though? We're like John. John was a, was a good guy. John was present at the crucifixion. He was the one Jesus loved. John was pretty squeaky clean. But even the squeaky clean good guy forgot the promises of God. And he became a little apathetic, didn't he? How many of us in here clock into church a couple of times? We serve every once in a while. We think we're good, but quite frankly, we have forgotten the promises and the commands of God. We've become a little apathetic. Here's the thing. Regardless of where we fall in all that, it doesn't matter what our background is. It doesn't matter the mistakes we've made. What matters is this. Do we have a desire to hear the truth? Do we have a desire to change? And if we have a desire to change, if we have a desire to accept and live by the truth, we can be saved, we can be empowered, we can live fulfilled, we can have peace, we can have joy, we can have self-control. We can live like this, we can truly live. 
And not just alone. It's not like when we get saved, God says, all right, you're saved. I'll see you when I come back for you. No, 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 no. He gives us his spirit. So we don't have to navigate this crazy life by ourselves. As confusing as the world gets, listen, if we are full of the Holy Spirit, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is discernment. No, how, no matter how confusing everything gets out there, if we have the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to discern what is good and, and what is evil. We are given the gift of wisdom that we can make wise choices. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is even courageous faith. That faith in God produces more faith in God when we are full of his spirit. In times of trouble, the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. It's called the counselor. We're not alone. We have guidance. We have help. He is with us all the time, not physically, but spiritually with us. So we can have life in his name. Now listen, I'm going to shift gears just for a second. Life in his name and truly living is not just for us. One of the greatest tragedies of the American church is we have become consumers, just like non-believers are consumers. We think this is all about us. I'm not trying to be rude in here this morning. If you have been a Christian in this room longer than three and a half years, it is time for you to stop constantly consuming and it is time for you to start contributing. Anybody? It's exactly how Jesus treated the disciples. After three and a half years, he goes, okay, guys, time for you to leave. Time for you to go out. And listen, it does no good for us to tweet about how bad the world is. The only thing that's going to change the atmosphere of our city, our schools, our government, boy, we need a lot of work there, all these different things, is we must go as people who carry the light of God into those dark corners and impact the world around us with the truth, with love. Well, man, you know, Murfreesboro's going to hell in a handbasket. What are you going to do about it? At this church every weekend, we got about 7,500 people. We can do some pretty big stuff in this town if we put our minds together, if we let the Holy Spirit lead us. And instead of us constantly com com complaining, why don't we go out and do some stuff? Clean some stuff up, throw our money at, at, at projects and have big things done. Partner with our schools instead of constantly complaining about our schools. And why don't we do something to make it better? This is why Jesus said, don't cover up your light. Let it shine so the whole city can see it. Jesus said this. It's in the Gospel of Matthew. So here's the thing. Jesus' resurrection had a purpose. I said this at the beginning of the service. Jesus didn't need to be resurrected. Jesus was always perfect. We needed Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' resurrection was all about our resurrection. And let me take it a step further. Our resurrection also has a purpose, and it's not just for us. We are resurrected in the hopes that we can share that with others and they can be resurrected as well. That they can be saved and understand what it means. We are called by God to touch the hearts of man. I hope that resonates with someone this morning. We can talk about how awful humanity is all day long, but if I do not have my hand in humanity, I just need to keep my mouth shut. We are called to touch the hearts of mankind. Every week I say this, and if you come here on a regular basis, you probably get tired of hearing it, but it's so important. We are constantly told to live by physical sight, to live by our senses, to pursue and follow our hearts, our desires. The, the problem with that, the conundrum with that, the, 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 the fault in that is the fruit of following self has been nothing but chaos. The fruit of following what we want has been nothing but death and destruction. Spiritual death and sometimes literal death. On the flip side of that, the pursuit of the resurrected Jesus yields resurrection for us, not just in eternity, today. That we can live with purpose and value and mission today. That we can live in contentment and joy and fulfillment today. And not only the resurrection now, because like I said at the very beginning, everyone will be resurrected one day. Eight billion people on planet Earth right now, they will all be resurrected one day, literally resurrected, either to eternal life or eternal separation from God. But the believer has two resurrections, and the first one can happen today. It happens in this life. 
So listen, and I'm gonna be very, very careful how I say this because I don't wanna be divisive and I don't wanna be a jerk. We have made Easter in the United States a, a circus. We have made the resurrection an event, listen, when the resurrection was meant to be a way of living. The resurrection isn't supposed to be something we just talk about once a year. The resurrection is something we should, that should be on our mind every day when we, when, we, when we wake up, when we go to work, when we go to school, when we raise our children, when we interact with our wife. The resurrection of Christ should be impacting us all the time. So here's where I have to be careful. It is very tempting for churches, and I'm not trying to be a jerk, to make this one weekend a year, this big event where you know explosions and crazy stuff is happening and someone's gonna sign autographs for you and we're gonna do all this stuff and we miss the fact that this should be an everyday occurrence. The celebration of the resurrection of Christ should be something that is constantly shaping how we do everything. And so I would be a fool, a fool. While I have all of you in this room, I would be a fool to not propose a question because celebrities and explosions and concerts are not going to save your soul. But a hard question like this just might. If we're being honest in this room this morning, what are we running after? Are we running after ourself? Are we running after our achievements? Are we trying to find our hope and our value in what we can do and what others think of us? Or are we chasing after? Are we running after? Are we connecting with a resurrected Jesus Christ? The resurrection is not just something we celebrate once a year. The resurrection should be something that changes everything about us all the time but it depends on what we're running after. It depends on what we're pursuing. Would you bow your heads with me, please?